summer, the northern hemisphere tilts away from the sun. Summer turns to fall on the way to winter. The animals can sense a hard winter is coming, and they eat what they can while the grass is still exposed. It's not even winter yet, but it's gotten cold. It was down to minus 11 this morning. It's up to zero now. The elk are out like it was summertime, but there's mist coming off the river and you can see frost along the edge. It is cold and I'm freezing right now and I've got a warm jacket on. The cold air from Canada makes Yellowstone National Park one of the coldest places in the lower 48. The temperature can drop dramatically and bring with it lots of snow which covers everything in a blanket of white. The snow transforms the summer landscape into breathtaking scenes, but behind the beauty, a challenge for survival. This is going to be a long, hard winter. Yellowstone in the winter can be a truly magnificent place, with a deep white snow and the steam coming from the thermals. The temperatures here can get down to minus 40 degrees. Along with the heavy accumulation, this can really change the dynamics of the ecosystem. As the sun rises over the winter landscape, a magical world of light, fog, and new textures appears. Part of the transformation is in the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. The Yellowstone River flows down into the canyon, creating the upper and lower falls. The falls can actually get covered over with a solid sheet of ice during especially cold spells. The ice will grow all the way to the bottom. Cold and the snow make Yellowstone geysers and other thermals even more dramatic with the massive amounts of steam because of the cold air. Old Faithful Geyser may not draw the crowds like in the summer, but it is still the number one winter stop. The steam freezes on whatever it contacts because of the cold. In this case, the steam is frozen onto so many layers that it has turned these trees into a forest of ghosts. Steam builds up on these crystalline structures on the trees and grasses. It is called hoarfrost. The smallest form of life in the park are the extremophiles, which are the heat and acid-loving microorganisms. They survive the extreme cold only by living in the hot thermal waters. Cyanobacteria forms these colorful mats. Here is another form of colorful long string bacteria called filamentous bacteria. The runoff from the geysers and hot springs creates warm spots that help other animals survive. The warmth exposes the grasses, which many of the animals need for food. This draws many of the animals to the thermal areas because less work is required to get at the food. The 
The geysers produce large quantities of hot water that flow into the Firehole River. This keeps the river warm enough that it seldom freezes, which provides a refuge and food for some of the animals. These trumpeter swans breed in Canada and have flown down to Yellowstone for the winter along with their cygnets. The ice-free river gives them safety as well as food. They feed on underwater plants. The warm river's edge exposes grasses, which the elk and the bison feed on. Away from the warm rivers, all this beautiful snow can turn Yellowstone into a desert, covering the plants that was the food for the animals. This is Lamar Valley. There's a lot of grass in this valley, but now in winter it's dead and covered with several feet of snow. That food source is important for the survival through the winter time, for herbivores like the bison. This is a field that the bison have dug up trying to get under the snow in order to survive. The way the bison does that is to plow through the snow using its big head and head muscles to push the snow aside and then dig down with its feet. That takes a lot of energy, but that's the way it gets to the grass in order to be able to survive. Bison are extremely adapted to survive in this environment. They have heavy coats and thick hides. Their big size allows them to carry a lot of fat, all of which gives them excellent insulation against the extreme cold. In general, the wolves will not bother a healthy adult bison. It is just too dangerous. They look big and slow, but in fact they can be fast, agile, and mean. When the snow becomes too deep or refrozen, then it takes a lot of precious energy for the bison to even walk. In the summer, the park is a large enough ecosystem to support most of the animals. But in the winter, many of the animals need a lower elevation to find food. This year, the snow in places became so hard to walk through that some of the bison took to the road to find a lower altitude. So bison jams became commonplace and sometimes lengthy. The bison generally leave the park in three places. The west entrance near West Yellowstone, the south entrance and onto the elk refuge in Jackson Hole, and the north entrance by Gardner, Montana. When the bison leave the boundaries of a national park, they enter a very different world. They become involved with the ranchers and the state and federal governments, the world of politics. Some bison carry a disease called brucellosis. Cattle ranchers don't want the bison infecting their cattle. Consequently, ranchers don't want the bison anywhere near the land their cattle use. The elk have very different challenges than the bison. Both originally had the same annual range that included a lot of territory outside the park. Both are hunted outside the park. But the elk are not as well equipped to survive in an extreme winter as the bison. The elk are the largest mammal population in the park, numbering about 6,000 in the summer and less than 500 in the winter. The elk have small hoofs which sink deep into the snow and make it virtually impossible to run. The elf's chief predator is the wolf. The wolves are much lighter and have big paws that keep them from sinking into the snow. Snowshoes, if you will. The wolves are very wary of humans, so they are usually seen at long distances of a mile or more. The elk population used to be 20 to 30,000, before the wolves were reintroduced. The wolves were originally killed because of the rancher's concern over killing cattle. They were reintroduced about 15 years ago to provide a natural balance to the surging elk populations. The elk can often be found feeding along the edge of a river. The water gives them some protection from the wolves. 
they are less likely also to go to thermal areas where there is less snow for fear of predators. The bull elks are large enough and with those big antlers are very dangerous prey for the wolves. But if the wolves can take one down, it is a big meal. Woody shrubs, such as what these elk are eating, don't provide as much nourishment as the dead grasses under the snow, but it can be easier to get to. In a harsh winter like this year, between the deep snow making it dangerous and the limited food, most of the elk will migrate to lower elevations and out of the protection of the park. Pronghorns are very fast animals and quite a bit smaller than elk. They are often referred to as antelope but in fact they are not a member of the antelope family. Their chief defense against the wolves is wariness and speed. In the summer, they can outrun a wolf, but in deep snow, they are defenseless. These pronghorns have long since migrated to lower elevations and outside the park. The bighorn sheep can go where the wolves can't, and in the bargain, find grasses sticking out of the steep slopes where the snow can't stick. Their concave hooves make them very effective at navigating the steep rocks. The snow is not as deep on the steep slopes, so digging through the snow is not as bad as in the valleys. Coyotes look similar to wolves but the coyote is about one-third the size of a wolf. At a long distance, it is difficult to judge size, so coyotes are often mistaken for wolves. A unique feature of a coyote is that it has much bigger ears. Their acute hearing allows them to find small animals underground, or even under several feet of snow. Coyotes primarily prey on smaller animals like rodents, birds, carrion, and in the spring, very small newborn elk. They will feed on larger carcasses, if given a chance by the bears and the wolves. The coyotes live in packs, like the wolves, but usually hunt alone. Prior to 1995, the coyotes had few predators. Humans tried to kill off both the wolves and the coyotes, but the coyotes adapted and survived. After the reintroduction of the wolves in 1995, the coyotes were no longer on the top of the food chain and the wolves started killing off some of the coyote pups. The red fox is the next smaller member of the canid family in Yellowstone and is related to both the wolf and the coyote. An even smaller animal is the pine marten. The pine marten can be found in conifer forests around fallen logs, hollow trees, or underground burrows. These cute animals primarily eat small mammals, berries, nuts, and carrion. Our winter exploration is coming to a close. With the approach of spring, the snow is starting to melt at the lower elevations. The snow is disappearing and the elk are returning to the park for the nutrient richer green grass. The bison along with their newborn calves are also going back into Yellowstone and bringing with them the returning tourists. The green grasses of the upper meadows are the objective of the returning animals. With the spring, a new beginning and the cycle of adaptation and survival starts all over again.
in Yellowstone. Whee! The snow. 